Welcome to episode 138 of Real Health Radio. You can find the links talked about as part of this episode at the show notes, which is www.7, so the word all spelt out, S-E-V-E-N hyphen health.com forward slash 138. Welcome to Real Health Radio. Health advice that's more than just about how you look. And here's your host, Chris Sandel. Hey guys, uh, welcome back and thanks for joining me for another episode of Real Health Radio. So I'm actually recording this episode while out in Australia and I mentioned in the intro to the previous episode that I was adding out here and thankfully everything has gone smoothly. Um, Ramsey is 15 months old so we went in with pretty low expectations about the journey and I kind of expected a screaming baby for hours and that it would be rather hellish. Um, this definitely isn't his normal demeanor, but it, it's kind of just kids on planes can, can be very different. Uh, but things turned out really nicely and we spent many hours walking up and down the aisle. Um, he'd started walking three or four weeks before we left, so he was sort of just loving it and, and wanted to practice his newfound talent. And so, yeah, lot, lots of walking and big smiles to other passengers and then he played with some toys at our feet or on our lap and uh, read some books and then managed to sleep for four or five hours on the first leg. Uh, we then had 36 hours in, in Singapore um, and then had to do it again, um, albeit for a, a shorter flight. It was only eight hours this time around. Um, but again, he was pretty chilled and, and happy to read or play with toys and then slept for four hours or so. Um, so yeah, all in all, the flight really couldn't have worked out much better. And we're going to be heading back to the UK in, in early January. So there's every every chance that it won't go as well second time around. Um, but we'll just have to see. And then for my time while I've been out here, it's been a mix of, of doing work and, and taking it easy. I played some golf. I've been going to the beach. I've caught up a lot with, with family and, and some with some friends. And my brother just had uh, his third child um, who arrived a couple of days after we did. So um, it's been enjoyable to get cuddles with my new niece. And it's also just been nice to get some sunshine in the middle of the UK winter. Um, so I have had some proper time off while I'm here with, with no work for a couple of weeks. And yeah, it's it's been very enjoyable. So that kind of brings you up to speed on on my holiday and what I've been up to and I, I guess I should really get on with the main part of the of the podcast and this episode is my yearly roundup of my favorite books documentaries and podcasts and this is the fourth year in a row that I've done this kind of podcast episode and what I also like about this kind of episode is that people always get in contact with me and respond and tell me what they've really enjoyed in this past year. So if you have a favorite book or a documentary or a podcast that you think I should check out, um, then drop me an email at info at seven health.com or you can go to the show notes for this episode, which is www.seven health.com forward slash 138 and leave a comment so starting with the books, um, this year I've read 25 books, and, and when I say read, this includes the books I've listened to on Audible. Uh, I think there were six of those, and it was a much slower start to the year on the reading front. So Ramsey was only a handful of months old um, at the start of the year, and so reading wasn't happening as much. But as he's got older, I, I've been reading a lot more. Uh, he'll often fall asleep in the car rather than um, then in the cot during the daytime and rather than risk, wake, risk uh, waking him and carrying him in, um, I will sit in the car and I'll, I'll read while he sleeps. And many of the books that I've been through uh, have really been while he's been napping. Um, I'm going to go through eight of my favorites for the year, um, but you can see the whole list at the show notes. And this is the same for the documentaries and the podcasts. And with each of them, I've linked to their Amazon pages, uh, in the case of the books, their IMDb pages in um, terms of the documentaries, and then um, for the podcast, just where, where they're hosted on the internet. Um, so it, it saves you time for searching. You can simply go to the show notes and, and look at the links and, and everything is there. Um, I usually have a favorite book for the year, um, but this year I don't. So so each of the ones I'm going to mention I, I thoroughly enjoyed, and they are in no particular order. So 
The first book I want to mention is called The Body Keeps the Score uh, by Bessel van der Kolk. And this was actually uh, something I did start reading at the start of the year. And I think it was the first book I, I read and started reading in the January time. So Bessel van der Kolk is a trauma specialist. He spent his career working with patients who've suffered from trauma. And he's also collaborated on many research studies to better understand trauma, both in the terms of what's happening, um, in terms of the, the, the body and, and the brain, but also looking at potential solutions and, and how and if they can help. And the book is really an overview of, of everything he's learned during his, his long career. And the book can be thought about as broken down into two categories. So the first half looks at the, the physiology and the psychology of trauma. So what happens in the body when someone has a traumatic event occur? Um, and the answer here really can be many different things. And so he uses different case examples to explain what are the various changes that can occur, why they occur, what are the mechanisms for this, and what are the long-term outcomes because of these specific changes. And I previously had Irene Lyon on the podcast where she talked about trauma and the nervous system and the book goes into some of the stuff that she was talking about in, in a lot more detail. The second half of the book is then looking at recovery and what are the various methods that can be used to heal from trauma. And here, Bessel van der Kolk uh, goes through each mo method or modality uh, separately. And so he'll be talking about how he became aware of each of them, and then he looks at the research that's been done to support it, and a lot of the time that's his own research, but it can be other people's research, and then giving examples of what this style of therapy looks like and how it works. And so I found this book incredibly helpful because trauma is something that comes up a lot in my practice, and now that I've learned to ask about it, it really is shocking how common it is. And as I always say to clients, like I'm not a trauma specialist, but I now have a better understanding of how it can be impacting on physiology and why people make the choices that they do. Um, and I'm also able to suggest that they work with someone who is a specialist in this area. And they can then read the book and read about the different modalities for healing and pick the one that feels uh, most in alignment with them. And then they can find someone who is then skilled in that area. And I've had a number of clients that, that have done this. So if you are a practitioner, I really strongly suggest that you read this book. I would actually suggest also that anyone can and, and should read this book. It's fascinating to better understand how the body and the mind works in response to trauma and the, the snowball effect that this has. Um, I will warn that there are many parts that aren't the easiest to read due to the graphic nature of what's described and, and really the, the horrific events that many people have gone through. But I would really implore you not to let this put you off and to check it out. So that was The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. So the next book I want to mention is Principles by Ray Dalio. So Dalio is an American hedge fund manager. He's the founder of Bridgewater Associates, uh, possibly the most successful hedge fund of all time. And they have roughly, I think it's $160 billion um, of assets under management, and Dalio himself is worth about $18 billion. So there's a really interesting story about how this book came into existence. And, and the story was actually shared by Sol Orwell um, at his site, SJO. Um, I'll link to the original article, but I'll give a short version here. And, and Sol Orwell is the founder of examine.com. So if anyone knows that website, um, I've had Kamal Patel on the podcast before who works for examine.com, but that's, that's Sol's background among other things. So the book Principles, it was originally released by Dalio as a PDF and it wasn't actively promoted or anything, but it became this cult PDF and it was downloaded over 3 million times solely through word of mouth. And one of the people who downloaded it was uh, Phil Cavaggio. And Phil is the co-founder of Precision Nutrition uh, with John Berardi. I've had a number of guests on the show who work for Precision Nutrition, like Chris Scott Dixon, Kate Solo, Brian St. Pierre. Uh, the panel discussion that I did earlier in the year on genetic testing was a collection of staff from, from PN. So Phil Cavaggio, he read the PDF and absolutely loved it. So much so that he wanted it to see the light of day as a proper book. Despite not knowing Dalio or 
not knowing anyone who could get in contact with him, he just goes out and hires a proofreader to tidy it up. He finds a book designer, and not just anyone on the cheap, um, but a guy called uh, Rodrigo Coral, who has won awards for books for people like Jay-Z. Um, and the process was not quick and took him, I think, nearly a year to finish. And it also wasn't cheap. He spent close to um, or more than 50000 uh, Canadian dollars on it. And then ensues a long process of finding someone who knows Dalio so he can get the book in his hands. He then finds someone, he flies to Connecticut, meets them in a garden center and hands them the book and then then nothing. He doesn't hear anything. And then eventually, months later, he receives a call and it's, it's Ray Dalio saying how much he loves the book and, and what he's done with it. And this is the large reason why the book then saw the light of day and then it got to become a New York Times bestseller, and then I and many, many other people got to read it. So that's a kind of a long intro into the conception of the book. Um, but the book in itself, it, it's broken down into three parts. So part one is Dalio's backstory, part two is his life principles, and part three is his work principles. And with the principle sections, what they go through is really how Dalio sees the world, like what are his beliefs? And why I find this fascinating, and I actually did a blog post on this book earlier in the year uh, when I'd read the book, Um, and yeah, why I find it fascinating is because the principles have been decades in the making. Like it's easy for someone to reach their, their 70s or their 80s to have been very successful and then sit down and think of all the reasons why this is so, to really create a, a, a post hoc story for why their life has turned out how it has. But in Dalio's case, these principles have been the core of how he built his company. They were written down, they were tested, they were iterated on um, over many, many years, over many, many decades. And the company then built software so they could better understand um, decision making and these principles and were guiding the software and they would see what would happen and then they would change them based on, on the outcomes. So Personally, I found the life principle section more helpful. Um, it was really interesting to, to hear how he sees the world. It challenged some of my own thoughts and, and biases. Um, he's big into all different types of psychometric testing and understanding how different people think and feel and how this affects their strengths and weaknesses for doing different tasks. Uh, the work principle section was less relevant to me, but that's just because a lot of the focus is on how to run a large company with hundreds or thousands of staff members and and how they manage to do this. So I'm not at a stage that that is impacting on me. So it it was interesting, but just less relevant. Um, He has two principles, one of radical honesty, another of radical transparency that are definitely not the norm, and and especially in the ways that he implements this um, at work. And there's actually a really great TED talk that he gave that goes through this. So I would definitely recommend checking that out. And I'll, I'll put that in the show notes if you want to give it a look. So overall, I found it a fascinating book. And I think Dalio is a very interesting character. And it, it really led me to spend time reflecting on how I view the world and, and how I am or who I am as a person. So I think any book that does that is is uh, is a good thing. Um, so that is Principles by Ray Dalio. So the next book is Rehabilitate, Rewire and Recover by Tabitha Fra. So I actually had Tabitha on the show recently to talk about this book. So rather than me spending too much time going through it here, I'll direct you to check out the episode 132 of the podcast. Um, so Tabitha suffered with anorexia, anorexia for nearly a decade um, and now on the other side of that, she, she helps others to recover and has spent countless hours talking to experts and going through research on the topic of eating disorders. And Rehabilitate, Rewire, Recover is a book aimed at those wanting to recover themselves. And so it, it is for the person who is, is seeking their own recovery, but I think equally it is helpful as a resource for practitioners um, because it just goes through so many different aspects of the recovery process. And from Tabitha's perspective, there are two big components of the recovery process. One is new uh, nutritional rehabilitation, which is eating food so the body can physically repair. And this often involves a lot of calories and doing this for an extended length of time, much longer than most people originally believe is going to be needed. 
And then the second component is neural rewiring. And this is basically changing the patterns in the brain. So when we learn something, this creates a pathway in the brain. Um, so the next time that we do this task, it's, it's much easier. So in terms of eating disorders, this means creating uh, new pathways that are different to, to the habitual habits that someone has been following. And to do this consistently so that those old pathways fade away. So this book walks through how to do this. It talks about the various symptoms that people get as part of the recovery process, as well as symptoms that are common while in the midst of an eating disorder. And I, I personally found the book helpful because I line up with Tabitha in, in much of her thinking. There, there are points of disagreement, but I have no problem getting behind the book. And so for me, it's been a helpful resource that I can then recommend to clients. So if you are suffering with an eating disorder or you are a, pr uh, a practitioner and you work with people who are, then I highly recommend checking out the book um, as well as the podcast episode that I, that I did with Tabitha. So that's Rehabilitate, Rewire, Recover by Tabitha Farrar. So the next book is Unconditional Parenting by Alfie Cohen. So this was actually one that I listened to on Audible. And if you are going to check it out, do listen to it on Audible. Like Cohen reads the book himself and he is such an enthusiastic narrator. Uh, the passion that he has for the topic is very clear in his voice. And Cohn is someone who I've loved for many years. Uh, I first came across his work through Matt Stone from 180 Degree Health probably six or seven years ago. And I read one of his previous books called Punished by Rewards, and I thought it was excellent. So in Unconditional Parenting, um, Cohn argues that children should receive unconditional love. And while most parents say that this is what they have for their children and this is what they do, this is not how certain behaviours are then interpreted by the child. And what I like about Cohn is that there's a level of research that he uses to back up all his suggestions. What he's presenting isn't simply what he believes or, or anecdotes. He really does go through the research to come up with his conclusions. And interestingly, what the research shows can often be counterintuitive to what we might think is the right thing to do. So, for example, he's not a, a, an advocate for praising children. And there is context here, but, but he argues and he shows through research that the more we praise children for what they're doing, the less they are intrinsically motivated to do this. So we praise a child for sharing, the child is then going to be less likely to share unless there's someone around to see them do it and then they receive praise for it. Um, so as I said, there, there is a level of detail, there's a level of context here that I, I can't get into as part of this very short synopsis. Um, but I do like how he goes through things um, and explains ideas that will run a little counter to what most people think. And so I originally listened to the book because obviously I have a new son, Ramsey, and I thought it would be helpful for me as a parent. Um, but what I found is I've ended up recommending it a lot to clients and even clients who don't have kids. And this is because it can help clients to realize how they were raised and how their parents have had an effect on that. But equally, it can be helpful as a way of seeing how people talk to themselves and that if we talk to ourselves in certain ways, it's going to lead to certain outcomes. The book also touches on areas like self-esteem, motivation, creativity, uh, perspective taking, communication skills, managing, managing our emotional states, and, and lots more. So while it is definitely aimed at parents and talks about things through the lens of raising children, there's so many ideas that are brought up that I would really suggest it for everyone. And as I said a moment ago, we are all someone's children, and so it can be helpful as a reflection on what your parents' parenting style was like and how this has affected you. So that's Unconditional Parenting by Alfie Cohen, and I highly recommend using Audible for, for this one. So the next book is Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. And I am pretty late to the party on this one. So it was originally translated from Hebrew into English in 2014 and then has gone on to sell, I think, over a million copies. And I was recommended the book numerous times over the, the, the previous 18 months. 
uh, until I finally sort of picked it up and decided to read it. So the book explores how humans have come to sit at top of the food chain and to create the world that we now live in. And it starts out from the Big Bang and then just works its way forward. So the 70,000 years ago, there were six different human species on Earth and, and it goes through what happened so that we ended up with just the one with Homo sapiens. And to explain then how we ended up where we are today, Harari focuses on four major areas. So there is the, the cognitive revolution, which is when we learn to imagine. And as Harari points out, societies run or our world runs because of our ability to believe collective stories and how if this really wasn't the case, we just couldn't live how we do. So, for example, uh, we have the stories about nations or money or human rights or companies or political structures or legal institutions these are all agreed upon ideas that have been made up and it's our imagination that then allows them to happen. So then the next area is the agricultural re revolution, um, then the unification of, of humankind, and then finally the scientific re revolution. And as part of this, he focuses on lots of different areas. So things like religion, the creation of money, capitalism, colonialism, scientific advancements like gene editing and uh, uh, immortality and lots more. And one of the strengths of Sapiens is how easy it is to read. So Harari is dealing with many meaty and dense topics and it could be easy to get bogged down in, in huge amounts of detail. I do imagine that there are probably experts in these areas that think he's simplified, simplified things too much or he's taken a view that helps his narrative. Uh, but for a lay reader, it makes for very interesting and entertaining reading. Um, part of the reason I think I, I put off reading Sapiens for a long time was because I'd previously read uh, Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs and Steel. And I thought they would be similar books. So in Guns, Germs and Steel, Diamond looks at why certain advancements happened in certain areas of the world. So why writing first appeared in X place rather than Y place or why ag agriculture took off in one place while another stayed as a hunter-gatherer society for an extra X number of years. And it is an amazing book and I highly recommend it. And I think it's appeared in one of my previous lists Um but it is not light reading and it does go into a huge amount of detail. And so I think um, when I was contemplating reading Sapiens, I was really thinking like, do I want to go through all this again? Uh, but Harari, um, who even references the book and says that it was one of his greatest inspirations for writing Sapiens, um, there isn't a lot of repetition. And what he's done in Sapiens is made an, an easier read. And, and I really do recommend checking this out to, to everyone. I think it's a great, a great book. So that's Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. Um, the next book is Come As You Are by Dr. Emily Nagalski. And this was a book that I kept seeing over and over again on other practitioners suggested reading lists. Um, so I decided to check it out for myself and I, I really was blown away by it. Um, Dr. Nagalski is a sex educator. She has a master's in psychology and a PhD in health behavior. She's also trained in the area of sexual violence prevention and stress management. And, and all this comes through in the book. So ostensibly the book is about sex aimed at women, uh, helping them to understand their body, to be confident and enjoy uh, life and their, their sex life. But through this lens, so many divergent ideas are used to, to make a case. And I'd argue that this isn't just a book for women, but is crucial for men to read as well. And I learned so much for this book and, and topics that I've previously written about before that I now know I was wrong on. And this isn't just because I'm a guy and so I haven't lived in a woman's body, but because Nagolsky is, is covering ideas that run counter to what we've been told or really just ideas that no one is talking about. Um, it debunks myths that uh, make men and women often feel inadequate and keeps hammering home the idea that, yes, you are normal and that despite the narrow array of bodies that we see or narrow array of experiences that are talked about, there is a wide spectrum of desires and bodies that are all normal. 
And I've actually reached out to Nagowski and we're going to try and arrange for a time for her to come on the podcast. It's probably not going to be until the springtime. Um, but at that stage, we'll then be able to speak about her upcoming book as well called Burnt Out, um, which is about stress and comes out in March 2019. So it'll be great to be able to, to talk about both of these. So please check out this book. Uh, the tagline for the book is The Surprising New Science That Will Transform Your Sex Life, which feels like an article in Cosmo and, and could be off-putting. And I, I had one client who mentioned this, but please see Paths this and, and give it a read because I really think it should be recommended reading for everyone. Um, and that's Come As You Are by Dr. Emily Nagolsky. Um, so the penultimate book I want to mention is Madness by uh, Maria Hornbacker. I always have difficulty remembering how to pronounce her first name correctly. Um, if you're a regular listener to, to the podcast, you should recognize the name. Uh, like Tabitha Farrar, she was a guest on the show earlier this year. Um, it was episode 131. Um, and we talk about this book and uh, her first book, Wasted. Um, so Madness is a memoir, and its area of focus is Hornbacker's life uh, living with bipolar. And it mainly focuses on the period of about 15 years from her early 20s until her mid to late 30s when the illness was at its worst. And it was a book that I read in a very short space of time. It was just so gripping. And it, <laughs> I, I say it was gripping while at the same time there were, there were moments where I just had to put the book down and just had to take a break. Like the, the intensity of what was going on in, in Hornbacker's life and the moments – um, of it all unraveling and then the long stretches of being stuck in these depressive and sedated states, it was it was difficult to read. And it isn't just the sequence of events that makes it so so gripping, but it's Hornbacker's writing style. Like she has this ability to create tension and play with with time and pace, which is phenomenal. Like when you watch a movie, this is often created by the score. So I, I think how well someone like Christopher Nolan uses music in films like Inception and The Prestige to, to really build that tension. Well, Hornbacker is able to do this with just words. And I would be reading it and noticing that I was reading it more quickly or that my heart was beating just that little bit faster simply because of how she was writing. And as she makes reference to in the book, and I actually talked about this with her on the podcast, she has a love of poetry. She writes and reads it incessantly, and, and this comes through in her prose where it feels like there has been thought given to every last word, making sure that it's the exact right word that will carry the most amount of weight. And in fact, since our conversation, I've, I've really had this desire to get into reading poetry myself, and I remember how much I enjoyed it at school, where we'd go through a poem and look at all the imagery and the meaning behind every line, and I was always amazed at how I'd often read a poem and, and not think much of it, um, but we'd then go through it and I'd see the level of detail that was underpinning each line and, and then I'd have this newfound respect for it. And I've actually become obsessed somewhat this year with the singer Father John Misty. Um, for, for some reason, his songwriting ability is, is phenomenal and it, it's like poetry, um, often irreverent poetry, set to music. Uh, especially his album Pure Comedy, which is somewhat of a, of a concept album that deals with so many of the struggles of what it's like to be a human in this time um, in, in history. And so I've been going through his, his songs and his lyrics and, and reading about them. I, I need to start doing the same thing with people like Leonard Cohen and, and artists of that ilk um, to kind of ease myself in into poetry. Uh, but anyway, that was a, a bit of a tangent, but I do want to stress just how much I enjoyed Madness. Like, even if you have no interest in bipolar, it's worth checking out. And I would say this especially if you're a writer, um, even as a practitioner writing about health, read Hornbacker's work to learn how you can be better at that craft. And it is something that I do a lot with reading uh, different fiction and then memoirs of writers like Stephen King, etc., to find out how to become a better writer. So that is Madness by uh, Maria Hornbacker. Um, 
So the final book I want to mention is Motivational Interviewing uh, by William Miller and Stephen Rolnick. Um, and the, the one that I read is the third edition. So motivational interviewing is a type of counseling. It's a counseling style. And I remember first hearing about it a number of years ago. I think it could have been Laura Schoenfeld, who I've had on uh, as a guest on the show, um, who first mentioned it to me. And it wasn't in the show. I think it was during just a conversation we were having. Um, then last year, while I was doing the, the level two coach training with precision nutrition, it came up a lot. And really sort of motivational interviewing was was the backbone of the type of coaching that they recommend. So given all of this, I decided to go back to the original source material and to to read the book uh, by Miller and and Rolnick. And yeah, as I said, I I read the first, the third edition, which is the most up-to-date version of the book. So I'd I'd recommend getting that one. And yeah, motivational interviewing is a a counseling style and it's client-centered and at its core is the idea that you are wanting to elicit change talk from the client. So rather than me telling the client all the reasons why change is necessary, have this come from the client and, and genuinely come from the client, not them telling you what they believe you want to hear. And a big part of this is dealing with ambivalence, which is the, the ability to hold two contradictory ideas at the same time. So having a list of all the reasons why change is good and a, a list of all the reasons why change is bad and that this is swirling around in people's heads and in their behavior, uh, whether consciously or unconsciously, all the time. So it's about exploring this ambivalence and, and resolving it so that change can then happen. And it's an approach that was first developed, I think, over 30 years ago while treating problem drinkers, and it's subsequently been used with drug addiction, and then it's been expanded out to be used with many different settings. And I think it's now taught as part of most, if not all, dietetics courses um, as a way of helping clients make change. And I I found this book hugely beneficial. The, The way it's structured and then the different examples and case studies make it uh, a really practical book. Um, I'm constantly wanting to improve as a pract- practitioner, and, and I honestly feel like it, it's a skill or these are the skills that too many people don't give enough time to. Like They want to learn about the latest test or what some new research says about vitamin C or the mitochondria or some new development in you know, the understanding of an enzyme pathway. And I think this information is helpful, but being able to sit with a client and to create a space that leads to change, this is invaluable. And and us humans, we are irrational, and simply being provided with the correct information doesn't guarantee that anything's going to happen, which is why I I do focus so much time on understanding psychology and, and human behavior and what makes people make the decisions that they do. So I would highly recommend this book to all practitioners. Even if you've read it, I would suggest rereading it again. It's definitely going to be one of those books that I reread on a regular basis as I continue to try and make the suggestions my normal way of working with clients. And that's it for for the books. Um, and as I said earlier, you can you can see the whole reading list for the year at the show notes. So now documentaries. Um, on this front, my viewing has taken a, a huge hit this year. Uh, with having a child and Ali being ill for a large chunk of the year, my, my life didn't have the same structure it once did. And there just wasn't the same time for me to be watching TV. And so while in previous years I've watched 30-plus documentaries, I think I hit 60 documentaries in, in 2015, this year I only made it to 12. And, and most of those have come in the last couple of months um, so I'm hoping next year will be better on this font and, and I already have a list of things that I'm, I'm wanting to check out. Um, so there's just going to be three that I'm going to, to recommend and, and talk about. Um, the first is called The Work. Um, and this was actually recommended um, or I saw a recommendation um, on the Facebook page for Brad Abrams. So Brad is someone who I've had on the podcast before a number of years ago because of a documentary called On the Back of a Tiger, 
which is a project that he was doing and, and I think he's still doing the, the documentary. He hasn't come out yet. Um, he also featured on my list of favourite documentaries for last year because of his documentary uh, Love and Sources, which is strange and endearing and, and worth a watch. Uh, but anyway, I, I take Brad's recommendations on board and so when I saw him post about the work, I decided to check it out. So the documentary, it's set inside Folsom Prison in the US and this is actually the prison that, that Johnny Cash played in, I think did a live album in. And so as part of the prisoner's rehabilitation, they do group therapy. And I think it's once or twice a year, they allow regular people from, from the outside world so who, aren't, uh, who aren't prisoners uh, to come inside and to do the therapy work with the prisoners. And so the documentary follows three men who come in from um, the, the outside world and do four days of group therapy. Um, the title of the film, The Work, could be a descriptor for what it's like watching the film because it feels like work. It, it is by no means easy viewing and it is incredibly intense as a film. Uh, the prison is populated almost entirely by gang members of, of one sort or another. And these are people who've committed some pretty gruesome crimes. And as part of the documentary, you are seeing these guys open up and talk about their childhoods and other dark parts of their past. And you can see in here this like deep pain that resides within them. But it then just becomes too much for them to handle and they explode into violence. And so other pre uh, prisoners are trying to pin them down. And this is all normal and part of the therapy that's being practiced. And the, the camera men and women like really do this phenomenal job because at no point does it feel like anyone is self-conscious that the camera is there. And they are incredibly forthcoming with their comments. And, and even with all the mayhem and the violence that then erupts, the camera is still there capturing it all. And this documentary really made me reflect on the podcast that I'd done earlier in the year about free will and whether or not it's really an illusion. Because more than ever, when you hear people's stories and see how much a product someone is of their environment, it does seem that free will is, is an illusion. And if I had endured the childhood that these men were talking about, it's likely that I'd be in the same place that they are. So I, I'm glad that Brad recommended this on Facebook, and I found it <laughs> a punishing but enlightening watch. Um, but I really do recommend checking it out. Um, so it's called The Work. The next documentary is called The Defiant Ones, and it's actually a four-part series, but I wanted to include it because it felt like one long documentary and because it was just outstanding. So this is a music documentary focusing on the partnership between Jimmy Iovine and, and Dr. Trey. So Jimmy Iovine was or is or was a record producer in New York um, and it's just incredible how he gets his start in his career. So from the very beginning, he's working with people like John Lennon and Bruce Springsteen and then Stevie Nicks and Patti Smith and Tom Petty and U2. Um, and then in the early 90s, he, he founds Interscope Records. Um, Dr. Dre is a rapper and record producer from, from Compton uh, in LA. And, and personally, this is a style like rap music has never been a huge part of my life. Um, so I knew who Dr. Dre was and I definitely knew a lot of the music, but it wasn't something that I actively listened to uh, when I was growing up. Um, but it charts his early life, his early career, him being in MW, NWA. Um, and then in 1992, Dr. Dre is signed to Interscope Records and his partnership with Jimmy Iovine starts. And really the documentary focused on so much of the music that was a big part of my teenage years and my, my 20s. And with many stories, uh, things that I just knew nothing about. Um, and so it talks about uh, and interviews people like Eminem, uh, Trent Reznor, Marilyn Manson, Snoop Dogg, uh, Gwen Stefani. Um, and yeah, the, the interviews that he gets with these kind of people, as well as people that I'd mentioned earlier on in terms of Bruce Springsteen and Stevie Nicks, etc., are just incredible. And it culminates with, with Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine 
Um, they founded Beats Headphones together, and they then go on to sell it to, to Apple for over $2 billion. Uh, so it really is an incredible story and a really well put together documentary. Um, I, I'm definitely not doing it justice in my description here, but I really want to suggest giving it a watch. Like everyone who has uh, watched it um, has kind of raved about it, and any time I mention someone they, they and they have seen it, they always talk about it in very positive ways. So it's called The Defiant Ones, um, and it's on Netflix. Um, so the final documentary I want to mention again, Again, probably loosely falls into the documentary category, um, and it's called The Push uh, by Darren Brown. So Darren Brown is an illusionist, or I think the term often used is a mentalist. Uh, Basically, he uses psychological tricks and triggers to get people to behave in certain ways. And many of his shows are on Netflix, so I would recommend checking them all out because he, he is simply incredible. I've actually gone and seen him live once before, and it just I, I don't understand how he does what he does. Um, but the premise for the push was to see if he could get a normal everyday person to, to kill another human being uh, by pushing them off a roof. So the setup is that everyone in the show is, is an actor and that there is a script or there is a, a narrative that they're working around and then the one subject that has been picked isn't an actor and they are an everyday person. And the show reminded me of many of the, the Milligan experiments that were done, I think it was in the 60s and 70s, so experiments where subjects would be asked to electrocute someone or give them electric shocks and, and be increasing the the severity of those electric shocks while they had someone telling them to, to continue to increase it, sort of looking at how um, people are socially obedient, looking at how things like um, the concentration camps and the, the rise of uh, Nazis and everything that went on there, how that could have happened. And so there, there is that kind of a tinge short of just looking at how humans can be easily persuaded by social compliance. Um, it is rather anxious viewing in parts, and it did lead to a long discussion between Ali and I once it was over, uh, especially around the, the ethical or moral question of putting someone through an experiment such as this and, and how they would deal with it afterwards. Um but I, I do recommend checking it out. So it's called The Push. Um, it's it's definitely available on Netflix, or at least it is in the UK. Um, so that is it on the on the documentary front. Um, so the final area I want to go through in terms of favourites for the year is podcasts. Um, in a similar vein to the documentaries, my podcast consumption this year has hugely decreased. So prior to having Ramsey, I would listen to a podcast in the morning while doing cooking and then pretty much cook with, with every meal that I cook throughout the day, I would have a podcast on in the kitchen. Um, I'd also often have it on for, for one of my walks each day. So I'd go for a walk with a dog twice a day and I'd, I'd listen to a podcast on one of those. So I was probably listening to two hours, sometimes three hours of podcast a day. So it's so a lot um, but now Ramsey's in the kitchen while I'm preparing meals, and so my attention is different, and I, I just have music on. Um, some of the times I'll have podcasts on while I'm walking, but most of the time when I'm out walking, I'm out walking with Ramsey as well. So it wasn't, it, it won't happen. Uh, I do make time to listen to podcasts for, for guest ideas during my my working day, but this is also just a little less than before. So I'm probably listening to only a couple of hours podcasts a week. Um, so probably the equivalent of what I used to listen to in a day or two, um, I'm now listening to in a week. So what I'm going to do is recommend a handful of my favorite podcast shows. And for each, I'll recommend a couple of episodes over the last year that I've enjoyed. Uh, and that way you can go and check out specific episodes rather than being overwhelmed about not knowing where to start. Um, but I am going to keep this pretty brief because I feel like a podcast is a much smaller commitment than than a book or, or a documentary. Um, and I also want to mention that, that none of the podcasts I'm, I'm going through here are health-related. I do listen to many of those podcasts. 
Um, but I also listen a lot to podcasts for escapism or just for general knowledge or for interests. And while the, head, the, the, the health podcasts are great for finding guests or for being sources uh, that I can point clients to or for increasing my own knowledge, it's really the, these other podcasts that I'm going to go through that I, I find most memorable or most enjoyable. So the, the first and my sort of favorite podcast is Revisionist History by Malcolm Gladwell. And I, I said the same thing last year. So Gladwell is one of my favorite authors and he's taken that skill of story writing in written form and, and moved it over into spoken word. So this year was the third series of the podcast. And with each series, there, there's 10 episodes. And when he has the 10 week stretch when they're released, I will listen to them every Thursday that they come out. I, I really enjoy them. And they're just interesting and engaging and, and varied um, in terms of the, the different topics it talks about. Um, so if you want to know where to get started from the most recent season, um, the final episode, uh, which is called Analysis uh, Parapraxis Elvis, is fantastic. So it looks at Elvis's inability to sing certain parts of a song i think it was are you lonesome tonight um whenever he performed it live and it's a, a really fascinating story about it and you you hear some of the live performances and it's it's kind of quite eerie um there's also a double episode that he did um all on memory um the first is called a polite word for liar and the second is called free brian wilson and they both look at how fallible our memory really is and that it's not like some video recorder of the way that we can feel like memory is and that this is even true for big events. So like where you were when you heard about 9-11 and what happened that day or incidents that happened during war, moments where we think we would remember correctly because of the intensity of the situation – actually just doesn't happen a lot of the time. Um, and I, I was inspired by these podcasts to write a blog post that came out this year, but it is really, really interesting. I, I think that Malcolm Gladwell really does have a, a strong skill in storytelling. So those would be the ones I'd start with from the last season if you, if you need recommendations, but I, I can't think of a bad episode. So I would highly recommend just going and listening to all, all 30 of them when you have the time. Um, so the next podcast I want to mention is Waking Up, uh, which is Sam Harris's podcast. So this is another one that I listen to pretty much as soon as the episode comes out. Um, and the episodes can be weekly. I think sometimes they were more than weekly and then sometimes they're, they're a lot less than that. Um, and I've made reference to Sam Harris numerous times before on this podcast. I, I talked about this podcast last year as well. Uh, he was the impetus for my solo episode on free will. Uh, he has a meditation app that's also called Waking Up that's fantastic and I recommend to clients regularly. Um, I've also read most of his books. And what I like about Waking Up is that Harris is great at having difficult conversations so for many of the episodes, he has on a guest that he disagrees with or he agrees with him on some points but not others. And while most people would shy away from areas of disagreement, he wants to explore them and, and see what headway can be made through discussion. And I really just don't know anyone else who is doing this. So there are a handful of episodes that I would, I would recommend um, checking out um, there's probably a little bit of a recency bias with, with these. I'd say episode 142 with Johan Hari, uh, which is all about uh, addiction and social isolation. So talking about Hari's two books on those topics. Um, episode 137 with Jonathan Haidt, uh, talking about college campuses and, and trigger warning and deplatforming of, of speakers and, and PC culture and um, lots of topics ar around that, which I thought was, was really fascinating. Um, I liked uh, episode 119 with Robin Hanson, but it's been a long time since I listened to it, so I can't remember exactly what's covered. It's, it's one of the live episodes, um, and so there's lots of different components that were, were covered as part of it. Um, and there's also a recent episode that Chris Anderson from TED, I think it's Chris Anderson, uh, from the TED conference, um, 
And so it's an episode from the new TED podcast um, where he interviews Sam Harris, um, but Sam rebroadcast it through his own podcast. And this is definitely a podcast where there are points of agreement, uh, disagreement, sorry, and where Anderson really challenges Harris on his approach and the way he talks about certain topics. And it was great because there are criticisms that I've thought about. Um, but it's also interesting and, and helpful to hear people disagree, uh, be civil as part of these disagreements, but also not back down or, or shy away. So being able to have difficult conversations. And so, yeah, I, I think Harris is probably the only person I know who is doing this well on a regular basis. Um, so I would highly recommend checking out his show. The next podcast show is Adam Buxton podcast. So Buxton is uh, a Brit. He's a great interviewer. And each episode feels like a real conversation rather than a set of pre-prepared questions. And he does all his interviews in person. So he'll go and go to someone's house or they'll meet up in a, in a coffee shop or whatever, which really helps. I think you can hear the difference in the conversation when it's like that. But he's also great at being able to have a chat and to be very funny. And I think sometimes we feel like it would be easier doing an interview in person, but I don't think that's always the case. And Buxton just has this real natural ability to make it flow really well and, and to have a great um, conversation with someone. And I would love to be able to borrow a bit of his lightheartedness and just how comfortable he, he sounds with his guests. And a couple of the, the episode recommendations I have, um, episode 66 with uh, the author Michael Lewis, so he wrote Moneyball and The Big Short, which I'm mentioning um, because they've both been turned into movies and people are more likely to know them. Um, and in that episode, they predominantly focus on his new book called The, the Undoing Project. Uh, there's episode 85 uh, with Michael Scott Moore, who is a different person to Michael Moore. Um, and this is about... Uh, the time that he was kidnapped by Somali pirates for, I think it's two or three years and, and that whole experience. And so it's a, a fascinating interview. Um, or episode 81 uh, with Louis Theroux. So Louis Theroux is the, the British documentarian um, and, and Boxen and Theroux are actually childhood friends. And so he's appeared on the show a number of times. And, and typically Theroux will go on the podcast when he has a new set of documentaries on the BBC. Um, and so he'll come on and he'll, he'll talk about them. And the episodes are always hilarious. Like I have memories of listening to this one while wandering around the supermarket shopping and I was on the verge of turning it off because I was laughing and probably looked uh, rather unhinged. So if you are in the mood for a laugh, then then I would definitely check out uh, that, doc, uh, that that episode, as well as hearing about the, the, the three documentaries that uh, Louis Theroux has recently released. Um, the next podcast episode or podcast show that I want to reference or make, make you aware of is called You Are Not So Smart. Um, and yeah, I've, I've referenced this on the podcast show before and in various blog articles. Um, it looks at different cognitive biases and fallacies and typically interviews, interviews researchers doing work in these various areas. Um, and I've reached out to the host of the show um, and I'm, I'm trying to get him to, to come on the podcast because um, I think he would be a fascinating guest. Um, I would check out episode... 131 called the marshmallow replication. So this looks at the, the famous marshmallow experiment, um, but talks about some of the assumptions that we got wrong and looks at what we're now discovering in the area of uh, childhood psychology and childhood learning. Um, and yeah, I, I found this to be hugely enlightening um, and a, a really good episode. And so the final podcast I want to mention is the Tim Ferriss show and this was one of the first podcasts that I really got into and I was just amazed that you could hear an interview with Jamie Foxx or with Kevin Costner and this would be 
for two or three hours and just, yeah, to be able to listen to those kinds of people and be exposed to that um, was just something so new and fascinating. And I, I really used to listen to every episode as soon as they come out or came out. Uh, these days, I've, I've gone off the show a little. I found I, I started to find Ferris a little frustrating as an interviewer, but more than anything else, I just found more and more podcasts that I've liked, and, and he has somewhat got squeezed out. So now I will typically just listen to the interviews where I know who the guest is, and I want to hear them have a, a long form conversation. So there are two episodes that I want to recommend. And for these, I really do suggest listening to them because they are fantastic episodes. So the first is episode uh, 313 uh, with Michael Pollan. So Pollan is best known for his writing around food with books like The Omnivore's Dilemma. But about Five years ago, he, he got interested in the new research uh, around using psychedelics. Uh, I think originally for ending for, for, for end of life conditions and, and helping people deal with the anxiety around dying, um, but then also for other mental health issues. So he's now spent many years going through the research on the topic and recently released a book called How to Change Your Mind. And so this was a really fascinating interview about the history of psychedelics, uh, how they work in the brain or how we believe they work in the brain, uh, what the state of the research is, and also about Pollan's experience of trying these different substances and trying them as someone in their mid-50s who's never done anything like this before. So he's not some old hippie who's used these drugs all throughout his life or had a period in his 20s where he was using them. This is someone who never had touched anything like this and then got fascinated about it in his later life and then wanted to or, or felt that he really should try this as part of writing the book. And I've heard Pollen do a number of podcasts as part of the press junket for this book and this episode is, is, is easily the best. Um, the second episode is, that I want to recommend uh, from the Tim Ferriss Show is episode 298 uh, with Dr. Gabor Maite. And so Gabor Maite is an extraordinary human being and, and someone whose work I followed for a long time. I've, I've read a number of his books, uh, including In the Realm of the Hungry Ghosts. He's a specialist in addiction and in trauma and writes and speaks uh, very eloquently and with a lot of sense on these topics. And so this episode is talking about his childhood and his life as a doctor, about trauma and how it impacts on the body and how people behave. And it also talks, uh, like in the Poland episode, about how psychedelics can, can help in this realm with a specific focus on ayahuasca, um, and Dr. Gabamete is just incredibly compassionate and wise. And so it was wonderful to get to listen to a conversation with him that went on for, for two and a half hours. So that is it for the podcast recommendations and, and for my recommendations for the year. Um, I hope this has given you some ideas of things to check out this year. Uh, as always, I love to hear your favorites as well. So if you've read or watched or listened to something that you think I need to check out, uh, leave a comment at the show notes or drop me an email at info at seven hyphen health.com. Uh, cause yeah, I would love to, to hear what's been, uh, good for you or interesting for you this year. Um, so that is it for this week's show. Uh, next week I will be back with another new episode. So I will catch you then. Thanks for listening to Real Health Radio. If you are interested in more details, you can find them at the Seven Health website. That's www.seven, S-E-V-E-N, hyphen health.com. <laughs>